Chapter Thirty Four of Kate Bonnet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Teresek. Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton. Chapter Thirty Four Captain Thomas of the Royal James. When Blackbeard's little fleet anchored in Topsail Inlet, Steed Bonnet, who had not been informed of the intentions of the pirate, was a good deal puzzled. Since joining Blackbeard's fleet in the vessel which came up from Belize, Bonnet had considered himself very shabbily treated, and his reasons for that opinion were not bad. During the engagements off Charlestown, his services had not been required, and his opinion had not been consulted blackbeard having no use for the one and no respect for the other the pirate captain had taken a fancy to ben greenway while his contempt for the scotchman's master increased day by day and it was for this reason that greenway had been taken on board the flagship while bonnet remained on one of the smaller vessels bonnet was in a discontented and somewhat sulky mood but when Blackbeard's full plans were made known to him, and he found that he might again resume command of his own vessel, the Revenge, if he chose to do so, his eyes began to sparkle once more. Ben Greenway soon resumed his former position with Bonnet, for it did not take Blackbeard very long to settle up his affairs, and in a very short time he became tired of the work of conversion, or, to speak more correctly, of the bore of talking about it. Bonnet was glad to have the Scotchman back again, although he never ceased to declare his desire to get rid of his faithful friend and helper, for when the revenge again came into his hands there were many things to be done, and few people to help him do it. "'It will be merchandise and fair trade this time,' said Ben, "'and you'll find it not so easy as your piracies, though safer,' and when you're off to see the governor and have got your pardon it'll be a happy day master bonnet for ye and for your daughter and for your brother-in-law and everybody in bridgetown what either knew ye or respected ye no more of that cried bonnet i did not say i was going to bridgetown or that i wanted anybody there to respect me it is my purpose to fit out the revenge as a privateer and get a commission to sail in her in the war between spain and the allies this will be much more to my taste ben greenway than trading in sugar and hides greenway was very grave there is so little difference said he between a privateer and a pirate that it is a great strain on a common mind to keep them separate but a commission from the king is better than a commission from the devil and we'll hope there won't be much of a war after all is said and done there was not much intercourse between blackbeard and bonnet at topsail inlet the pirate was on very good terms with the authorities at that place who for their own sakes cared not much to interfere with him and bonnet had his own work in hand and industriously engaged in it he went to bath and got his pardon he procured a clearance for St. Thomas, where he freely announced his intention to take out a commission as privateer, and he fitted out his vessel as best he could. Of men he had not many, but when he left the inlet he sailed down to an island on the coast, where Blackbeard, having had too many men on his return from Charlestown, had marooned a large number of the sailors belonging to his different crews finding this the easiest way of getting rid of them. Bonnet took these men on board with the avowed intention of taking them to St. Thomas, and then he set sail upon the high seas as free and untrammeled as a fish-hawk sweeping over the surface of a harbor with clearance papers tied to his leg. Steed Bonnet had changed very much since he last trod the quarter-deck of the Revenge as her captain. He was not so important to look at, and he put on fewer airs of authority but he issued a great many more commands in fact he had learned much about a sailor's life of navigation and the management of a vessel 
and was far better able to command a ship than he had ever been before. He had had a long rest from the position of a pirate captain, and he had not failed to take advantage of the lessons which had been involuntarily given him by the veteran scoundrels who had held him in contempt. He was now, to a great extent, sailing-master as well as captain of the Revenge, but Ben Greenway, who was much given to that sort of thing, undertook to offer Bonnet some advice in regard to his course. "'I am no sailor,' said he, "'but I can a chart when I see it, "'and it is my opinion that there is no need "'o your sailing so far to the east "'before you turn about southward. "'There is naething much sticking out from the coast "'between here and St. Thomas.' "'Bonnet looked at the Scotchman with lofty contempt. "'Perhaps you can tell me,' said he, "'what there is sticking out from the coast "'between here and Ocracoke Inlet, "'where you yourself told me that Blackbeard had gone "'with the one sloop he kept for himself.' "'Blackbeard!' shouted the Scotchman. "'And what in the devil have you got to do with Blackbeard?' "'Do with that infernal dog!' cried Bonnet. I have everything to do with him before I do aught with anybody or anything besides. He stole from me my possessions. He degraded me from my position. He made me a laughing stock to my men. And he even made me blush and bow my head with shame before my daughter and my brother in law, two people in whose sight I would have stood up grander and bolder than before any others in the world. He took away from me my sword and he gave me instead a wretched pen. He made me nothing where I had been everything. He even ceased to consider me any more than if I had been the dirty deck under his feet. And then when he had done with my property and could get no more good out of it, he cast it to me in charity as a man would toss a penny to a beggar. Before I sail anywhere else, Ben Greenway, continued Bonnet, I sail for Ocracoke Inlet, and when I sight Blackbeard's miserable little sloop, I shall pour broadside after broadside into her until I sink his wretched craft with his bedizzled carcass on board of it. But will your men stand by you? cried Greenway. You're neither a pirate nor a vessel o' war to enter into business like that. Bonnet swore one of his greatest oaths. "'There is no business nor war for me, Ben Greenway,' he cried. "'Until I have taught that insolent Blackbeard what manner of man I am.' Ben Greenway was very much disheartened. "'If Blackbeard should sink the revenge instead of Master Bonnet sinking him,' he said to himself, "'and would be kind enough to maroon my old master and me, "'it might be the best for everybody after all.' Master Bonnet is vera humble-minded and complacent when bad fortune comes upon him, and it is my opinion that on a desert island I could well manage him for the good of his soul. But there were no vessels sunk on that cruise. Blackbeard had gone, nobody knew where, and after a time Bonnet gave up the search for his old enemy and turned his bow southward. Now Ben Greenway's countenance gleamed once more. "'It'll be a glad day at Spanish Town when Mistress Kate shall get my letter.' "'And what have you been writing to her?' cried Bonnet. "'I told her,' said Ben Greenway, "'how at last ye had come to your right mind, "'and how ye are a true servant of the king, "'with your pardon in your pocket "'and your commission waiting for ye at St. Thomas, "'and that... "'Whatever else you may do at sea, "'there'll be no more black flag floatin' over your head, "'nor a seesaw plank wobblin' under the feet of anybody else. "'The days of your piracies are over, "'and you're an honest man once more.' "'You wrote her that?' said Bonnet with a frown. "'Aye,' said Greenway, "'and I left it in the care o a good man "'whose ship is well on its way to Kingston by this day.' That afternoon Captain Bonnet called all his men together and addressed them. He made a very good speech, 
a better one than delivered when he first took real command of the revenge after sailing out of the river at Bridgetown, and it was listened to with respectful and earnest interest. In brief manner he explained to all on board that he had thrown to the winds all idea of merchandising or privateering, that his pardon and his ship's clearance were of no value to him except he should happen to get into some uncomfortable predicament with the law, that he had no idea of sailing toward St. Thomas, but intended to proceed up the coast to burn and steal and rob and slay wherever he might find it convenient to do so, that he had brought the greater part of his crew from the desert island where Blackbeard had left them, because he knew that they were stout and reckless fellows, just the sort of men he wanted for the piratical cruise he was about to begin, and that in order to mislead any government authorities who by land or sea might seek to interfere with him, he had changed the name of the good old revenge to the Royal James, while its captain, once Steed Bonnet, was now to be known on board and everywhere else as Captain Thomas, with nothing against him. He concluded by saying that all that had been done on that ship from the time she first hoisted the black flag until the present moment was nothing at all compared to the fire and the blood and the booty which should follow in the wake of that gallant vessel, the Royal James, commanded by Captain Thomas. The men looked at each other, but did not say much. They were all pirates, although few of them had regularly started out on a piratical career, and there was nothing new to them in this sort of piratical dishonor. In the little cruise after Blackbeard, the captain had shown himself to be a good man, ready with his oaths and very certain about what he wanted done. So, whenever Steed Bonnet chose to run up the Jolly Roger, he might do it for all they cared. Poor Ben Greenway sat apart, his head bowed upon his hands. "'You seem to be in a bad case, old Ben,' said Bonnet, gazing down upon him. "'But you throw yourself into needless trouble. As soon as I lay hold of some craft which I am willing shall go away with a sound hull, I will put you on board of her and let you go back to the farm. I will keep you no longer among these wicked people, Ben Greenway, and in this wicked place.' Ben shook his head. I started with ye and I stay with ye, said he, and I'll follow ye to the very gates of hell. But farther than that, Master Bonnet, I will na go. At the gates of hell, I leave ye. End of chapter thirty four. Recording by Meg Turasek. Chapter thirty five of Kate Bonnet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turasek. Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton. Chapter 35 A Chapter of Happenings. For happiness with a flaw in it, it was a very fair happiness which now hung over the Delaplaine home near Spanish Town. Kate Bonnet's father was still a pirate, but there was no Captain Vince in hot pursuit of him, seeking his blood. Kate could sing with the birds and laugh with Dickory whenever she thought of the death of the wicked enemy. This was not, it may be thought, a proper joy for a young maiden's heart, but it came to Kate whether she would or not. The change was so great from the fear which had possessed her before. The old home life began again, although it was a very quiet life. Dickory went into Mr. Delaplaine's counting-house, but it was hard for the young man to doff the naval uniform which had been bestowed upon him by Blackbeard, for he knew he looked very well in it, and everybody else thought so and told him so, but it could not be helped and with all convenient speed he discarded his cocked hat and all the rest of it, and clothed himself in the simple garb of a merchant's clerk. Although it might be said that in all the West Indies, at that day, 
there was no clerk so good-looking as was Dickory. Dame Charter was so thankful that her boy had come safely through all his troubles, so proud of him, and so eminently well satisfied with his present position, that she asked nothing of her particular guardian angel but that Steed Bonnet might stay away. If, after tiring of piracy, that man came back, as his relatives wished him to do, the good dame was sure he would make mischief of some sort, and as like as not in the direction of her dickory. If this evil family genius should be lost at sea or should disappear from the world in some equally painless and undisgraceful fashion, Dame Charter was sure that she could, in a reasonable time, quiet the grief of poor Kate. For what right-minded damsel could fail to mingle thankfulness with her sorrow that a kind death should relieve a parent from the sins and disgraces which in life always seemed to open up in front of him? About this time there came a letter from Barbados, which was of great interest to everybody in the household. It was from Master Martin Newcomb, and of course was written to Kate, but she read many portions of it to the others. The first part of the epistle was not read aloud, but it was very pleasant for Kate to have read it to herself. This man was a close lover and an ardent one. Whatever had happened to her fortunes, nothing had interfered with his affection. Whatever he had said, he still bravely stood by, and to whatever she had objected in the way of obstacles, he had paid no attention whatever. In the parts of the letter read to her uncle and the others, Master Newcombe told how, not having heard from them for so long, he had been beginning to be greatly troubled. But the arrival of the Black Swan, which, after touching at Kingston, had continued her course to Barbados, had given him new life and hope, and it was his intention, as soon as he could arrange his affairs, to come to Jamaica and there say by word of mouth, and do, in his own person, so much for which a letter was totally inadequate. The thought of seeing Kate again made him tremble as he walked through his fields. This was read inadvertently, and Dickory frowned. Dame Charter frowned, too. She had never supposed that Master Newcombe would come to Spanish Town. She had always looked upon him as a very worthy young farmer, so worthy that he would not neglect his interest by travelling about to other islands than his own. She did not know exactly how her son felt about this, nor did she like to ask him, but Dickory saved her the trouble. "'If that Newcomb comes here,' he said, "'I'm going to fight him.' "'What?' cried his mother. "'You would not do that. "'That would be terrible. "'It would ruin everything.' "'Ruin what?' he asked." His mother answered diplomatically, "'It would ruin all your fine opportunities in this family.' Dickory smiled with a certain sarcastic hardness. "'I don't mean,' said he, "'that I am going to hack at him with a sword, because neither he nor I properly know how to use swords, and after the wonderful practice that I have seen, I would not want to prove myself a bungler even if the other man were a worse one.' No, mother, I mean to fight with him by all fair means to gain the hand of my dear Kate. I love her, and I am far more worthy of her than he is. He is not a well-disposed man, being rough and inconsiderate in his speech. Dickory had never forgiven the interview by the river bank when he had gone to see Madame Bonnet, and as to his being a stout lover, he is none of it. Had he been that— he would long ago have crossed the little sea between Barbados and here. "'Do you mean, you foolish boy,' exclaimed Dame Charter, "'to say that you presume to love our mistress Kate?' And her eyes glowed upon him with all the warmth of a mother's pride, for this was the wish of her heart, and never absent from it. "'Aye, mother,' said Dickory, "'I shall fight for her. I shall show her that I am worthier than he is, and that I love her better.' I shall even stride for her if that mad pirate comes back and tries to overset everything. Oh, do it before that, cried Dame Charter, anxiety in every wrinkle. 
do it before that. Mr. Delaplaine was a little troubled by the promised visit from Barbados. He had heard of Master Newcomb as being a most estimable young man, but the fault about him, in his opinion, was that he resided not in Jamaica. For a long time the good merchant had lived his own life, with no one to love him, and he now had with him his sister's child, whom he had come to look upon as a daughter, and he did not wish to give her up. It was true that it might be possible, under favorable pressure, to induce young Newcomb to come to Jamaica and settle there, but this was all very vague. Had he had his own way, he would have driven from Kate every thought of love or marriage until the time when his new clerk, Dickory Charter, had become a young merchant of good standing, worthy of such a wife. Then he might have been willing to give Kate to Dickory, and Dickory would have given her to him, and they might have all been happy. That is, if that hair-brained bonnet did not come home. The Delaplaine family did not go much into society at that time, for people had known about the pirate and his ship, the Revenge, and the pursuit upon which Captain Vince of the Royal Corvette Badger had been sent. They had all heard, too, of the death of Captain Vince, and some of them were not quite certain whether he had been killed by the pirate bonnet or another desperado equally dangerous. Knowing all this, although if they had not known it they would scarcely have found it out from the speech of their neighbors, the Delaplaines kept much to themselves. And they were happy, and the keynote of their happiness was struck by Kate, whose thankful heart could never forget the death of Captain Vince. Mr. Delaplaine made his proper visit to Spanish Town, to carry his thanks and to tell the governor how things had happened to him and the governor still showed his interest in Mistress Kate Bonnet, and expressed his regret that she could not come with her uncle, which was a very natural wish indeed for a governor of good taste. This is a chapter of happenings, and the next happening was a letter from that good man, Ben Greenway, and it told the most wonderful, splendid, and glorious news that had ever been told under the bright sun of the beautiful West Indies. It told that Captain Steed Bonnet was no longer a pirate, and that Kate was no longer a pirate's daughter. These happy people did not join hands and dance and sing over the great news, but Kate's joy was so great that she might have done all these things without knowing it. So thankful was she that once again she had a father. This rapture so far outshone her relief at the news of the death of Captain Vince that she almost forgot that that wicked man was safe and dead. Kate was in such a state of wild delight that she insisted that her uncle should make another visit to the governor's house and take her with him, that she herself might carry the governor the good news. And the governor said such heartwarming things when he heard it that Kate kissed him in very joy. But as Dickory was not of the party, this incident was not entered as part of the proceedings. Now society, both in Spanish Town and Kingston, opened its arms and insisted that the fair star of Barbados should enter them, and there were parties and dances and dinners, and it might have been supposed that everybody had been a father or a mother to a prodigal son, so genial and joyful were the festivities, Kate high above all others. At some of these social functions Dickory Charter was present, but it is doubtful whether he was happier when he saw Kate surrounded by gay admirers, or when he was at home imagining what was going on about her. There was but one cloud in the midst of all this sunshine, and that was that Mr. Delaplaine, Dame Charter, and her son Dickory could not forget that it was now in the line of events that Steed Bonnet would soon be with them and beyond that all was chaos. And over the seas sailed the good ship, the Royal James, Captain Thomas in command. End of chapter 35 Recording by Meg Turasek Chapter 36 
Chapter Thirty Six of Kate Bonnet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turasek. Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton. Chapter Thirty Six. The Tide Decides. It was now September and the weather was beautiful on the North Carolina coast. Captain Thomas, late Bonnet, of the Royal James, late Revenge, had always enjoyed cool nights and invigorating morning air, and therefore it was that he said to his faithful servitor, Ben Greenway, when first he stepped out upon the deck of his vessel lay comfortably anchored in a little cove in the cape fear river that he did not remember ever having been in a more pleasant harbour this well-tried pirate captain steed bonnet as we shall call him notwithstanding his assumption of another name was in a genial mood as he drank in the morning air from his point of view he had a right to be genial he had a right to be pleased with the scenery and the air. He had a right to swear at the Scotchman, and to ask him why he did not put on a merrier visage on such a sparkling morning. For since he had first started out as Captain Thomas of the Royal James, he had been a most successful pirate. He had sailed up the Virginia coast. He had burned, he had sunk, he had robbed, he had slain, he had gone up the Delaware Bay, and the people in the ships and the people on the coasts trembled even when they heard that his black flag had been sighted. No man could now say that the former captain of the Revenge was not an accomplished and seasoned desperado. Even the great Blackbeard would not have cared to give him nicknames, nor dared to play his blithesome tricks upon him. He was now no more Captain Nightcap to any man. His crew of hairy ruffians had learned to understand that he knew what he wanted, and, more than that, he knew how to order it done. They listened to his great oaths, and they respected him. This powerful pirate now commanded a small fleet, for in the cove where he lay his flagship also lay two good-sized sloops, manned by their own crews, which he had captured in Delaware Bay and had brought down with him to this quiet spot, a few miles up the Cape Fear River, where he now was repairing his own ship, which had had a hard time of it since she had again come into his hands. For many a long day the sound of the hammer and the saw had mingled with the song of the birds, and Captain Bonnet felt that in a day or two he might again sail upon the sea, conveying his two prizes to some convenient mart, while he could, with his good ship, freshened and restored, would go in search of more victories, more booty, and more blood. "'Greenway, I tell you,' said Bonnet, continuing his remarks, "'you are too glum. You've got the only long face in all this, my fleet.' Even those poor fellows who man my prizes are not so solemn, although they know not, when I have done with them, whether I shall maroon them to quietly starve or shall sink them in their own vessels. But I had no such reason to be cheerful, said Ben. I had bound myself down by ye till ye had gone to the devil, and I had no chance of freeing myself from my responsibilities by perishing on land or in the sea. "'If anything could make me glum, Ben Greenway, it would be you,' said the other. "'But I am getting used to you, and some of these days when I have captured a ship laden with Scotch liquors and Scotch plaids, I believe that you will turn pirate yourself for the sake of your share of the prizes, which is likely to be on the same morning that you turn to be an honest man.' said Ben, but I am not in the way of expecting miracles. On went the pounding and sawing, and the hammering and the swearing, 
and the singing of birds, although the latter were a little farther away than they had been, and in the course of the day the pirate captain, erect, scrutinizing, and blasphemous, went over his ship, superintending the repairs. In a day or two everything would be finished, and then he and his two prizes could upsail and away. It was a beautiful harbor in which he lay, but he was getting tired of it. There were great prospects before our pirate captain. Perhaps he might have the great good fortune to fall in with that low-born devil, Blackbeard, who, when last he had been heard from, commanded a small vessel, fearing no attack upon this coast. What a proud and glorious moment it would be when a broadside and another and another should be poured in upon his little craft from the long guns of the Royal James. Bonnet was still standing, reflecting, with bright eyes, upon his dazzling future, and wondering what would be the best way of letting the dastardly Blackbeard know whose guns they were which had sunk his ship, when a boat was seen coming around the headland. This was one of his own boats, which had been posted as a sentinel, and which now brought the news that two vessels were coming in at the mouth of the river, but that as the distance was great, and the night was coming on, they could not decide what manner of craft that they were. This information made everybody jump on board the Royal James, and the noise of the sawing and the hammering ceased as completely as had the songs of the birds. In a few minutes that quick and able mariner, Bonnet, had sent three armed boats down the river to reconnoitre. If the vessels entering the river were merchantmen, they should not be allowed to get away. But if they were enemies, although it was difficult to understand how enemies could make their appearance in these quiet waters, they must be attended to, either by fight or flight. When the three boats came back, and it was late before they appeared, every man upon the Royal James was crowded along her side to hear the news, and even the people on the prizes knew that something had happened, and stood upon every point of vantage, hoping that in some way they could find out what it was. The news brought by the boats was to the effect that two vessels, not sailing as merchantmen, and well armed and manned, were now ashore on sandy bars, not very far above the mouth of the river. Now Bonnet swore bravely. If the work upon his vessels had been finished, he would up anchor and away and sail past these two grounded ships, whatever they were and whatever they came for. He would sail past them and take with him his two prizes. He would glide out to sea with the tide and he would laugh at them as he left them behind. But the Royal James was not ready to sail. The night was now low, five hours afterward, when it should be high. Those two ships, whatever they were, would float again. And the Royal James, whatever her course of action should be, would be cut off from the mouth of the river. This was a greater risk than even a pirate as bold as Bonnet would wish to run, and so there was no sleep that night on the Royal James. The blows of the hammers and the sounds of the saws made a greater noise than they had ever done before, so that the night birds were frightened and flew shrieking away. Every man worked with all the energy that was in him, for each hairy rascal had reason to believe that if the vessel they were on did not get out of the river before the two armed strangers should be afloat, there might be hard times ahead for them. Even Ben Greenway was aroused. The devil shall not get him any sooner than can be helped, he said to himself, and he hammered and sawed with the rest of them. On his stout and well-armed sloop the Henry, Mr. William Rett, of Charlestown, South Carolina, paced anxiously all night. Frequently from the sandbar on which his vessel was grounded, he called over to the other sloop, 
also fast grounded, giving orders and asking questions. On both vessels everybody was at work, getting ready for action when the tide should rise. Some weeks before the wails and complaints of a tortured sea coast had come down from the Jersey shores to South Carolina, asking for help at the only place along the coast whence help could come. A pirate named Thomas was working his way southward, spreading terror before him and leaving misery behind. These appeals touched the hearts of the people of Charlestown, already sore from the injuries and insults inflicted upon them by Blackbeard in those days, when Bonnet sat silently on the pirate ship, doing nothing and learning much. There was no hesitancy. For their own sake and for the sake of their commerce, this new pirate must not come to Charlestown Harbor, and an expedition of two vessels, heavily armed and well manned and commanded by Mr. William Rett, was sent northward up the coast to look for the pirate named Thomas, and to destroy him and his ship. Mr. Rett was not a military man, nor did he belong to the Navy. He was a citizen capable of commanding soldiers, and as such he went forth to destroy the pirate Thomas. Mr. Rett met people along the coast who told him where he might find the pirate, but he found no one to tell him how to navigate the dangerous waters of the Cape Fear River. And so it was that soon after entering that fine stream he and his consort found themselves aground. Mr. Rett was quite sure that he had discovered the lair of the big game he was looking for. Just before dark, three boats, well filled with men, had appeared from up the river, and they had looked so formidable that everything had been made ready to resist an attack from them. They retired, but every now and then during the night, when there was quiet for a few minutes, there would come down the river on the wind the sound of distant hammering and the noise of saws. It was after midnight before Henry and the sea nymph floated free, but they anchored where they were and waited for the morning. Whether they would sail up the river after the pirate, or whether he would come down to them, daylight would show. Mr. Rett's vessels had been at anchor for five hours, and every man on board of them were watching and waiting, when daylight appeared and showed them a tall ship, under full sail, rounding the distant headland up the river. Now up came their anchors and their sails were set. The pirate was coming. Whatever the Royal James intended to do, Mr. Rett had but one plan, and that was to meet the enemy as soon as possible and fight him. So up sailed the Henry, and up sailed the sea nymph, and they pressed ahead so steadily to meet the Royal James that the latter vessel, in carrying out what was now her obvious intention of getting out to sea, was forced shoreward, where she speedily ran upon a bar. Then, from the vessels of Charlestown, there came great shouts of triumph, which ceased when first the Henry and then the sea nymph ran upon other bars and remained stationary. Here was an unusual condition. Three ships of war, all aground, and about to begin a battle, a battle which would probably last for five hours if one or more of the stationary vessels were not destroyed before that time. It was soon found, however, that there would only be two parties to the fight, for the sea nymph was too far away to use her guns. The Royal James had an advantage over her opponents, since, when she slightly careened, her decks were slanted away from the enemy, while the ladders were presented to her fire. At it they went, hot and heavy. Bonnet and his men now knew that they were engaged with commissioned war vessels, and they fought for their lives. Mr. Rett knew that he was fighting Thomas, the dreaded pirate of the coast, and he felt that he must destroy him before his vessel should float again. The cannon roared. 
the muskets blazed away, and the combatants were near enough even to use pistols upon each other. Men died, blood flowed, and the fight grew fiercer and fiercer. Bonnet roared like an incarnate devil. He swore at his men. He swore at the enemy. He swore at his bad fortune, for had he not missed the channel, the game would have been in his own hands. So on they fought, and the tide kept steadily rising. The five hours must pass at last, and the vessel which first floated would win the day. The five hours did pass, and the Henry floated, and Bonnet swore louder and more fiercely than before. He roared to his men to fire and to fight, no matter whether they were still aground or not, and with many oaths he vowed that if any one of them showed but a sign of weakening, he would cut him down upon the spot. But the hairy scoundrels who made up the crew of the Royal James had no idea of lying there with their ship on its side, while two other ships, for the sea nymph was now afloat, should sail around them, rake their decks, and shatter them to pieces. So the crew consulted together, despite their captain's roars and oaths, and many of them counseled surrender. Their vessel was much farther inshore than the two others, and no matter what happened afterward, they preferred to live longer than fifteen or twenty minutes. But Bonnet quailed not before fate, before the enemy, or before his crew. If he heard another word of surrender, he would fire the magazine and blow the ship to the sky with every man in it. Raising his cutlass in air, he was about to bring it down upon one of the cowards he berated, when suddenly he was seized by two powerful hands, which pinned his arms behind him. With a scream of rage, he turned his head and found that he was in the grasp of Ben Greenway. "'Let go your sword, Master Bonnet,' said Ben. "'It is of no use to you now, for you canna get away from me. I'm nay older than you are, though I look it, and I've got the harder muscles.' You may be making your way steadily and surely to the gates of hell, and it may not be possible that I can prevent you, but I'm not going to let you tumble in by accident so long as I've got two arms left to me. Pale, haggard, and writhing, Steed Bonnet was disarmed, and the Jolly Roger came down. End of chapter 36 Recording by Meg Turasek Chapter 37 of Kate Bonnet This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton Chapter 37 Bonnet and Greenway Part Company it was three days after this memorable combat, for the vessels engaged in it needed considerable repairs, when Mr. Rett of Charlestown sailed down the Cape Fear River with his five vessels, the two with which he had entered it, the pirate Royal James, and the two prizes of the latter, which had waited quietly up the river to see how matters were going to turn out. On the Henry sailed the pirate Thomas, now discovered to be the notorious Steed Bonnet, and a very quiet and respectful man he was. As has been seen before, Bonnet was a man able to adapt himself to circumstances. There never was a more demure counting-house clerk than was Bonnet at Belize. There never was a humbler dependent than the almost unnoticed Bonnet after he had joined Blackbeard's fleet before Charlestown. And there was never a more deferential and respectful prisoner than Steed Bonnet on board the Henry but it was really touching to see how this cursing and raging pirate deported himself as a meek and uncomplaining gentleman. There was no prison-house in Charlestown, 
but steed bonnet's wicked crew including ben greenway for his captors were not making any distinctions in regard to common men taken on a pirate ship were clapped into the watch-house and a crowded and uncomfortable place it was and put under a heavy and military guard the authorities were however making distinctions where gentlemen of family and owners of landed estates were concerned no matter if they did happen to be taken on a pirate ship and major bonnet of barbados was lodged in the provost marshal's house in comfortable quarters with only two sentinels outside to make him understand he was a prisoner the capture of this celebrated pirate created a sensation in charlestown and many of the citizens were not slow to pay the unfortunate prisoner the attentions due to his former position in society he was very well satisfied with his treatment in charlestown which city he had never before had the pleasure of visiting the attentions paid to ben greenway were not pleasing sometimes he was shoved into one corner and sometimes into another he frequently had enough to eat and drink but very often this was not the case bonnet never inquired after him if he thought of him at all he hoped that he had been killed in the fight for if that were the case he would be rid of his eternal preachments greenway made known the state of his own case whenever he had a chance to do so but his complaints received no attention and he might have remained with the crew of the royal james as long as they were shut up in the watch-house had not some of the hairy cut-throats themselves taken pity upon him and assured the guards that this man was not one of them and that they knew from what they had heard him say and seen him do that there was no more determined enemy of piracy in all the western continent so it happened that after some weeks of confinement greenway was let out of the watch-house and allowed to find quarters for himself the first day the scotchman was free he went to the provost marshal's house and petitioned an interview with his old master bonnet hey ho cried the latter who was comfortably seated in a chair reading a letter and where do you come from ben greenway i had thought you were dead and buried in the cape fear river you did not think i was dead replied ben when i seized ye and held ye and kept ye from burying yer sir in that same river bonnet waved his hand no more of that said he i was unfortunate but that is over now and things have turned out better than any man could have expected better exclaimed ben i vow i know not what that means bonnet laughed he was looking very well he was shaved and wore a neat suit of clothes ben greenway said he you are now looking upon a man of high distinction at this moment i am the greatest pirate on the face of the earth yes greenway the greatest pirate on the face of the earth i have a letter here which was received by the provost marshal and which he gave me to read which tells that blackbeard the first pirate of his age is dead therefore ben greenway i take his place and there is no living pirate greater than i am and ye you pride yourself on that at this moment asked ben truly amazed that i do said bonnet and think of it ben greenway that presumptuous overbearing blackbeard was killed and his head brought away sticking up on the bow of a vessel what a rare sight that must have been ben think of his long beard all tied up with ribbons stuck up on a bow of a ship and ye are now the head deal on earth said ben you can put it that way if you like said bonnet but i am not so looked upon in this town i am an honoured person i doubt very much if any prisoner in this country was ever treated with the distinction that is shown me but i don't wonder at it i have the reputation of two great pirates joined in one the pirate bonnet of the dreaded ship revenge and the terrible thomas of the royal james my man there are people in this town who have been to me and who have said that a man so famous should not even be imprisoned i have good reason to believe that it will not be long before pardon papers are made out for me and that i may go my way and your men asked greenway will they go free or will they be hung like common pirates bonnet frowned impatiently i don't want to hear anything about the men he said of course they will be hung what could be done with them if they were not hung but it is entirely different with me i am a most respectable person and now that i am willing to resign my piratical career having won in it all the glory that can come to one man that respectability must be considered 
"'Well, well,' said the Scotchman. "'And when it comes to that, respectability is better for a man's soul and body than righteousness. "'Then I am no fit counsellor for you, Master Bonnet.' "'And he took his leave. "'The next morning, when Ben Greenway left his lodging, "'he found the town in an uproar. "'The pirate Bonnet had bribed his sentinels, and with some others had escaped. "'Ben stood still and stamped his foot. "'Such infamy! such perfidy to the authorities who had treated him so well the scotchman could not at first imagine but when the truth became plain to him his face glowed his eye burned this vile conduct of his old master was a triumph to ben's principles wickedness was wickedness and could not be washed away by respectability the days passed on bonnet was recaptured more securely imprisoned put upon trial found guilty and in spite of the efforts of the advocates of respectability was condemned to be hung on the same spot where nearly all the members of his pirate crew had been executed during all this time ben greenway kept away from his old master he had borne ill treatment of every kind but the deception practised upon him when at his latest interview bonnet talked to him of his respectability having already planned an escape and returned to his evil ways was too much for the honest scotchman he had done with this man, faithless to friend and foe, to his own blood and even his own bad reputation. But not quite done. It was but half an hour before the time fixed for the pirate's execution that Ben Greenway gained access to him. What? cried Bonnet, raising his head from his hands. You here? I thought I had done with you. Aye, I'm here, said Ben Greenway. I have stood by you in good fortune and in bad fortune and i never left you no matter what happened and i told you i would follow you to the gates of hell but i could go no farther i kept my word and here i stop farewell the only comfortable thing about this business said bonnet is to know that at last i am rid of that fellow End of chapter thirty seven Chapter thirty eight of Kate Bonnet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen Moore. Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton. Again, Dickory was there. There were indeed gay times in Spanish Town, and with the two loads lifted from her heart, Kate helped very much to promote the gaiety if this young lady had wished to make a good colonial match she had opportunities enough for so doing but she was not in that frame of mind and encouraged no suitor but bright as she was she was not so bright as on that great and glorious day when she received ben greenway's letter telling her that her father was no longer a pirate there were several reasons for this gradually growing twilight of her happiness and one was that no letter came from her father to be sure there were many reasons why no letter should come there were no regular mails in these colonies which could be depended upon and besides the new career of her father sailing as a privateer under the king's flag would probably make it very difficult for him to send a letter to jamaica by any regular or irregular method moreover her father was a miserable correspondent and always had been thus she comforted herself and was content though not very well content to wait then there was another thing which troubled her when she thought of it that good man and steady lover martin newcombe had written that he was coming to spanish town and she knew very well what he was coming for and what he would say but she did not know what she would say to him and the thought of this troubled her in a letter she might put off the answer for which she had been so long and patiently waiting but when she met him face to face there could be no more delay she must tell him yes or no and she was not ready to do this there was so much to think of so many plans to be considered in regard to going back to barbados or staying in jamaica that really she could not make up her mind at least not until she had seen her father she would be so sorry if mr newcombe came to spanish town before her father should arrive or at least before she should hear from him then there was another thing which added to the twilight of these cheerful days and this kate could scarcely understand because she could see no reason why he should affect her 
the governor whom they frequently met in the course of the pleasant social functions of the town looked troubled and was not the genial gentleman he used to be of course he had a right to his own private perplexities and annoyances but it grieved kate to see the change in him he had always been so cordial and so cheerful he was now just as kind as ever perhaps a little more so in his manner but he was not cheerful kate mentioned to her uncle the changed demeanour of the governor but he could give no explanation he had heard of no political troubles but supposed that family matters might easily have saddened the good man he himself was not very cheerful for day after day brought nearer the time when that uncertain steed bonnet might arrive in jamaica and what would happen after that no man could tell one thing he greatly feared and that was that his dear niece kate might be taken away from him dame charter was not so very cheerful either only in one way did she believe in steed bonnet and that was that after some fashion or another he would come between her and her bright dreams for her dear dickory and so there were some people in spanish town who were not as happy as they had been still there were dinners and little parties and society made itself very pleasant and in the midst of them all a ship came in from barbados bringing a letter from martin newcombe a strange thing about this letter was that it was addressed to mr delaplaine and not to miss kate bonnet this of course proved the letter must be on business and although he was with his little family when he opened his letter he thought it well to glance at it before reading it aloud the first few lines showed him that it was indeed a business letter for it told of the death of madame bonnet and how the writer martin newcombe as a neighbor and friend of the family had been called in to take temporary charge of her effects and having done so he hastened to inform mr delaplaine of his proceedings and to ask advice this letter he now read aloud and kate and the others were greatly interested therein although they cautiously forbore the expression of any opinion which might rise in their minds regarding this turn of affairs having finished these business details mr delaplaine went on and read aloud and in the succeeding portion of the letter mr newcombe begged mr delaplaine to believe that it was the hardest duty of his whole life to write what he was now obliged to write but that he knew he must do it and therefore would not hesitate at this the reader looked at his niece and stopped go on cried kate her face a little flushed go on the face of mr delaplaine was pale and for a moment he hesitated then with a sudden jerk he nerved himself to the effort and read on he had seen enough to make him understand that the duty before him was to read on End of chapter thirty eight chapter thirty nine of kate bonnet this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen moore kate bonnet by frank r stockton the blessings which come from the death of the wicked it was three weeks after martin newcombe's letter came before ben greenway arrived in spanish town he had had a hard time to get there having but little money and no friends to help him but he had a strong heart and an earnest and so he was bound to get there at last and although kate saw no visitors she saw him she was not dressed in mourning she could not wear black for herself she greeted the scotchman with earnestness he was a friend out of the old past but she gave him no chance to speak first ben she exclaimed have you a message for me no message he replied but i hae something on my heart i wish to say to ye i hae toiled and labored and hae striven why money obstacles to get to ye and to say it she looked at him with her brows knit wondering if she should allow him to speak then with the word scarcely audible between her tightly closed lips she said ben what is it it is this and no more nor less replied the scotchman he was never fit to be your father and it is not fit now for ye to remember him as your father i was faithful to him to the vera last but there was no truth in him it is an abomination and a wickedness for ye to remember him as your father kate spoke no words nor did she shed a tear it was my heart's desire ye should know it said the scotchman and i came mony a weary league to tell ye so ben said she i think i have known it for a long time but i would not suffer myself to believe it but now 
having heard your words i am sure of it uncle said she an hour afterward i have no father and i never had one with tears in his eyes he folded her to his breast and peace began to rise in his soul no greater blessing can come to really good people than the absolute disappearance of the wicked and the wickedness which had so long shadowed and stained the life of kate bonnet was now removed from it it was hard to get away from the shadow and to wipe off the stain but she was a brave girl and she did it in this work of her life a work that if not accomplished would make that life not worth the living kate was much helped by dickory and he helped her by not saying a word about it or ever allowing himself when in her presence to remember that there had been a shadow or a stain and if he thought of it at all when by himself his only feeling was one of thankfulness that what had happened had given her to him even the governor brightened he had striven hard to keep from kate the news which had come to him from charles town suppressing it in the hopes that it might reach her more gradually and with less terrible effect than if he told it but now that he knew that she knew it the blessings which are shed abroad by the disappearance of the wicked affected him also and he brightened there were no functions for kate but she brightened striving with all her soul to have this so for her own sake as well as that of others as for mr delaplaine dame charter and dickory they brightened without any trouble at all the disappearance of the wicked having such a direct and forcible effect upon them dickory charter who matured in a fashion which made everybody forget that kate bonnet was eleven months his senior entered into business with mr delaplaine and jamaica became the home of this happy family whose welfare was founded as on a rock upon the disappearance of the wicked here then was a brave girl who had loved her father with a love which was more than that of a daughter which was the love of a mother of a wife who had loved him in prosperity and in times of sorrow and of shame who had rejoiced like an angel whenever he turned his footsteps into the right way and who had mourned like an angel whenever he went wrong she had longed to throw her arms around her father's neck to hold him to her and thus keep off the hangman's noose her courage and affection never waned until those arms were rudely thrust aside and their devoted owner dastardly repulsed true to herself and to him she loved her father so long as there was anything parental in him which she might love and true to herself when he had left her nothing she might love she bowed her head and suffered him as he passed out of his life to pass out of her own End of chapter thirty nine Chapter forty of Kate Bonnet This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton. Chapter forty. In the river at Bridgetown lay the good brig King and Queen, just arrived from Jamaica on her deck was an impatient young gentleman leaning over the rail and watching the approach of a boat with two men rowing and a passenger in the stern this impatient young man was dickory carter that morning arrived at bridgetown and not yet having been on shore he came for the purpose of settling some business affairs partly on account of miss kate bonnet and partly for his mother as the boat came nearer dickory recognized one of the men who were rowing and hailed him hey ho tom hillier he cried i am right glad to see you on this river again i want a boat to go to my mother's house know you of one at liberty the man ceased rowing for a moment and then addressed the passenger in the stern who having heard what he had to say nodded briefly well well dick charter cried out the man and have you come back as governor of the colony you look fine enough anyway but if you want a boat to go to your mother's old home you can have a seat in this one we're going there and our passenger does not object pull up here cried dickory and in a moment he had dropped into the bow of the boat which then proceeded on its way the man in the stern was fairly young handsome sunburned and well dressed in a suit of black when dickory thanked him for allowing him to share his boat 
the passenger in the stern nodded his head with a jerk and an air which indicated that he took the incident as a matter of course not to be further mentioned or considered the men who rowed the boat were good oarsmen but they were not thoroughly acquainted with the cove especially at low tide and presently they ran upon a sandbar then up rose the passenger in the stern and began to swear with an ease and facility which betokened long practice dickory did not swear but he knit his brows and berated himself for not having taken the direction of the course into his own hands he who knew the river and the cove so well the tide was rising but dickory was too impatient to sit still and wait until it should be high enough to float the boat that was his old home that little house at the head of the cove and he wanted to get there he wanted to see it part of the business which brought him to barbados concerned that little house with a sudden movement he made a dive at his shoes and stockings and speedily had them lying at the bottom of the boat then he stepped overboard and waded towards the shore in some of the deeper places he wetted the bottom of his breeches but he did not mind that the passenger in the stern sat down but he continued to swear presently dickory was on the dry sand and running up to that cottage door a little back from the front of the house and in the shade there was a bench and on this bench there sat a girl reading she lifted her head in surprise as dickory approached for his bare feet had made no noise then she stood up quickly blushing you she exclaimed yes cried dickory and you look just the same as when you first put your head above the bushes and talked to me except that i am more suitably clothed she said and she was entirely right for her present dress was feminine and extremely becoming dickory did not wish to say anything more on this subject and so he remarked i have just arrived at the town and i came directly here lucilla blushed again this is my old home added dickory but you knew we were here she asked with a hesitating look of inquiry oh yes said he i knew that the house had been let to your father now she changed colour twice first red then white are you she said i mean the other is she i left her in jamaica said dickory but i am going to marry her for the moment the rim of her hat got between the sun and her face and one could not decide very well whether her countenance was red or white i am very glad to find you here said dickory and may i see your father and mother yes said she but they are both in the field with my young sister but who is this man walking up the shore and is that the boat you came in it is said dickory we stuck fast but i was in such a hurry that i waded ashore i don't know the man he had hired the boat and kindly took me in i was in such haste to get here for a moment lucilla bent her eyes on the ground in such a haste to get here she said to herself then she raised her head and exclaimed oh i know that man he is the pirate captain who captured the belinda which afterward brought us here and with both hands outstretched she ran to meet him the face of captain ichabod glowed with irrepressible delight one might have thought he was about to embrace the young woman notwithstanding the presence of dickory and the two boatmen but he did everything he could do before witnesses to express his joy dickory now stepped up to captain ichabod oh now i know you cried he and he held out his hand you were very kind indeed to my friends and they have spoken much about you this is my old home this is the house where i was born yes yes indeed said captain ichabod a very good house bedad a very good house but hesitating a little and, and addressing lucilla you don't live here alone do you the girl laughed oh no she cried my father and mother will be here presently in fact i see them coming that's very well said ichabod very well indeed it's quite right that they should live with you i remember them now they were on the ship with you oh yes said lucilla still laughing quite right quite right said ichabod that was very right 
"'I will go greet your father and mother and the dear little Lena. "'I remember them so well,' said Dickory. "'He started to run off in spite of his bare feet, "'but he had gone but a little way when Lucilla stopped him. "'She looked up at him, and this time her face was white. "'Are you sure,' said she, "'that everything is settled between you and that other girl?' "'Very sure,' said Dickory, looking kindly upon her "'and remembering how pretty she had looked "'when he first saw her face over the bushes. "'She did not say anything, but turned and walked back to Captain Ichabod. "'She found that tall gentleman somewhat agitated. "'He seemed to have a great deal on his mind which he wished to say, "'feeling at the same time that he ought to say everything first. "'That's your father and mother,' said he, "'stopping to talk to the young man who was born here?' yes she answered and they will be with us presently very good very good that's quite right said captain ichabod hurriedly but before they come i want to say that is i would like you to know that i have sold my ship i am not a pirate any longer i am a sugar planter bedad beg your pardon that is i intend to be one you remember that you once talked to me about sugar planting in barbados and so i am here i want to find a good sugar plantation to buy it and live on it i heard that you were stopping on this side of the river and so i came here but there is no sugar plantation here said lucilla very demurely oh no said ichabod oh no of course not but you are here and i wanted to find you a sugar plantation would be of no use without you she looked at him still very demurely i don't quite understand you she said she turned her head a little and saw that her family and dickory were slowly moving towards the house she knew that with diffident persons no time should be lost for if interrupted it often happened that they did not begin again then i suppose she said her face turned up towards him but her eyes cast down that you are going to say that you would like to marry me of course of course exclaimed ichabod i thought you knew that that is what i came here for bedad very well then said lucilla turning her eyes to the face of the man she had dreamed of in many happy nights no no she added quickly you must not kiss me they are all coming and there are the two boatmen he did not kiss her but later he made up for the omission the moment Mrs. Mander saw Captain Ichabod and her daughter standing together, she knew exactly what had happened. She had noticed things on board the Belinda. She hurried up to Lucilla and drew her aside. "'My dear,' she whispered with a frightened face, "'you cannot marry a pirate. You never, never can.' "'Dear mother,' said Lucilla, "'he is not a pirate. He has sold his ship and is going to be a sugar planter.' now they all came up and heard these words of lucilla yes indeed said captain ichabod you may not suppose it but your daughter and i are about to marry and will plant sugar together now i want to buy a plantation where is that young man who was born here bedad dickory advanced laughing here was a fine opportunity a miraculous opportunity of disposing of the bonnet estate which was part of the business which had brought him here so he told the beaming captain that he knew of a fine plantation up the river which he thought would suit him very good said captain ichabod i have a boat here let us go and look at the place and if it suits us i will buy it bedad so with mrs mander and her husband beside her and with lucilla and the captain by her the boat was rowed up the river with dickory and young lena in the bow when the boat reached the bonnet estate it was run up on the shore near the shady spot where kate bonnet had once caught a fish then they all stepped out upon the little beach even the oarsmen made the boat fast and joined the party who started to walk up to the house suddenly captain ichabod stopped and said to mr mander i don't think i care to walk up that hill you know and if you and your good wife will look over that house and cast your eyes about the place i will buy it if you say so you know a good deal more about such things than i do bedad i suppose of course that will suit you he said to lucilla it suited lucilla exactly they sat in the shade in the very place where kate had sat when she saw master newcombe crossing the bridge 
a small boat came down the river rowed by a young man as he passed the old bonnet property he carelessly cast his eyes shoreward but his heart took no interest in what he saw there what did it matter to him if two lovers sat there in the shade close to the river's brink his sad soul now took no interest in lovers he had just been up the river to arrange for the sale of his plantation to one of his neighbours he had decided to leave the island of barbados and return to england the house suited captain ichabod exactly when mrs mander told him about it and lucilla agreed with him because she was always accustomed to trust her mother in such things so they all got into the boat and rowed back to dickory's old home and on the way captain ichabod told dickory that when they returned together to the town he would pay him for the plantation having brought specie sufficient for the purpose it was a gay party in the boat as they rowed down the river it was a gay party at the house when they reached it and they would have all taken supper together had the manders been prepared for such hospitality but they were poor having taken the place upon a short lease and having had but few returns so far but they were all going to live at the old bonnet place and happiness shone over everything it was twilight and the two young men were about to walk down to the boat one of them promising to come again early in the morning when lucilla approached dickory where are you going to live with that girl she asked in a low voice in jamaica said he i am glad of it she replied quite frankly they were well content those jamaica people when ben greenway came to live with them it had been proposed at one time that he should go to his old bridgetown home and take charge of the place as he used to but the good scotchman demurred to this i have served an master before he became a pirate he said and i don't want to try another after he is finished being un if i serve any mon let him be one who has been righteous where is righteous now and will continue in righteousness then serve mr de la plaine said dickory the manders soon removed to the little house where dickory was born the mansion of their daughter and her husband was a hospitable place and a lively but the life there was so wayward erratic and eccentric that it did not suit their sober lives and the education of their young daughter so they dwelt contentedly in the cottage at the head of the cove and there was much rowing up and down the river it was upon a fine morning that the ex-pirate ichabod thus addressed a citizen of the town yes sir i know well who once lived in the house i own i knew the man myself i knew him at belize he was a dastardly knave and would have played false to the sun the moon and the stars had they shown him an opportunity bedad but i also knew his daughter she sailed on my ship for many days and her presence blessed the very boards she trod on she is a most noble lady and if you will not admit sir that her sweet spirit and pure soul have not banished from this earth every taint of wickedness left here by her father then sir bedad stand where you are and draw the end. End of chapter forty. End of Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton.